Mali is a political frontier. This side, England's green and pleasant land. That side, what some see as a red and peasant land, the independent republic of Clay Cross. You don't actually need a passport to go there, but it's a funny place. Because it's here that 10 men and one woman have built a defiant socialist Jerusalem. Take the kids in that school there, those kids between seven years and 11, get free milk just as if Mrs. Thatcher had never existed. Or take that old age pension on the pavement there. He gets free television licenses. If he's got a colour set, he still gets a free licence. Or the corporation workmen, they've just had an increase of 33 and a third percent. Pay pause? Well, that doesn't seem to apply in Clay Cross. On the council houses over there, the rent for those is £1.69, which is about half of what it would be anywhere else in the country. It's this grubby utopia nestling in the Derbyshire hills that has brought the British Labour Party, as one of its former ministers, Lord Kennett, said this week, to a turning point of history. For 15 months now, the Labour Party in Clay Cross has been breaking the law of the land and forcing their friends in Parliament to face the realities of smash-and-grab socialism in a conservative world. This is a part of England where 14 pits have shut down in the past 10 years. Unemployment has sometimes hit 20%. But one thing has stayed constant, the tradition of a company town, the cheap roof over your head and folk at the big house to look after you. Since the coal owners left in the 40s, the bosses have been the workers, miners with no pits to go down. The priorities of a committed left-wing council are plain in anyone's language, work and housing. It all started back in 1962 when Labour took control of the council. Within a few years, they'd knocked down half Clay Cross. Houses like these company houses, one up, one down, without even the luxury of a window at the back. And the people are rehoused in new council houses. But you don't move at that kind of pace without running slap into problems. Problems like an enormous burden of debt and a posse of aggrieved ratepayers. By 1969, the subsidy from the rates to the council houses was six times the national average. And most councils are dealing with that by increasing council house rents, not Clay Cross. The council said not a penny would go on those rents. The clerk to the council put in constant requests for an increase in council house rents. The district auditor came in with a threat of fines and surcharges, and finally the council budged. But not very far. They put three quarters of the debt on the rates and only a quarter on the council house rent. So Mr Heath and his Housing Finance Act weren't trying anything new in Clay Cross. Others had tried to do the same thing before. And they'd failed too. Well, I left the, the party for the, uh, the financial policies that were carrying out. They, they suddenly made a decision that council house rents were never going to go up again. And as a result of this, the... Um, housing revenue deficit went up from uh, approximately £4,000 to £27,000. I thought this was an unfair burden on the, uh, the owner-occupiers, people struggling to pay the uh, mortgages. I didn't think it was a, an incentive to attract industry. You can't very well go to a, uh, an industrialist and say, come to Clay Cross and help subsidise council house rents. And uh, as a result of this, I, I, we was also warned that... Um, by the auditor, that if we continued with this policy, we would cease building council houses, and this has in fact happened. It all came to a head in the sunny days of October 1972, when the government's Housing Finance Act came into force. As the traffic roared down Claycross's main street, the message went out to the government that one part of England would not give way. The standard was calmly nailed to the mast. We shall not implement the Housing Finance Act in Clay Cross, I can assure you on that. Eleven weeks of non-cooperation later, the government fired a warning shot. The district auditor arrived to a predictable reception. Hey! He's he never touched them, Tom! He never touched them! The estimated debt for the first six weeks of defiance, £7,000. My name is Lacey and I am the district auditor. With my deputy, Mr Pickwell, and a member of my staff, Mr Arnside, I'm here today to resume the extraordinary audit which was adjourned on the 7th of December. I think this is the biggest confrontation there's been between any government and the people since 1926. <laughs> We shall not be moved! We shall not be moved! 
The minister is a coward, a political coward, the biggest since Munich. The auditor said, pay up. The 11-man council promptly appealed to the High Court and lost. I can assure anybody that we carry on as councillors and despite whatever they say, the auditor will not get his money and the rent in Claycroft will not go up because we are now going back to Claycroft now and there will be a total rent and rate strike indefinitely period. As we've said all along, we've no intention of paying it anyway. Even if this means going to jail? Even if this means going to jail, you know, the same old pattern. We, we'll go to jail if it means going to jail. The next move, a government housing commissioner. Well, put your man out of retirement. He hasn't got the guts to come and do it himself. Yes. I'm not a politician. I'm a public servant. You're a puppet of this government. I'm a public servant and I'm not a politician. Well, I've, you, I've, you served both, the rent. I've served both governments in my day. Yes, I know you have. You've served them and you've got a £5,000 retirement pension. I wish and I you've had. come out of retirement. I wish I had. Civil servants, scab labour. Well, I wish... Well, which is it? Anyhow, I'm sorry about that interruption. What was it you were saying? There was no doubt what the council was saying. They refused to give the commissioner house room. He retired hurt to Chesterfield. They bared their wounds. There's so much political fornication in, in this nation of ours, you know, where you've even got Al Wilson saying two years ago, oh, no, you don't implement the act, and uh, he, he was against it, but we've never heard from him since, and there's been so many authorities in this nation said, no, not on your life shall we implement uh, the Housing Finance Act, but yet they have. There's so much fornication floating them out on this, but not in Clay Cross. <laughs> Early in November, the council tried a new sally. This time against the government's pay board. They decided to drive a dustbin lorry through phase three. They ordered their officials to give the 94 council workmen, bin men, grave diggers and street sweepers a 33 and a third percent pay rise. These men are efficient. They're as efficient as any other council workman in the authority. I work for a council called Tory Control, although, and I'm pampered with bonus schemes. Every Friday afternoon, I am bogged down for two hours of filling forms in. And at the end of the fortnight later, when I get my bonus, it might be a few pence or a few pounds, depending on what I've done, because it's a mean tested bonus scheme. We don't believe in that. These men have asked for a 33 and a third percent across the board payment to all staff. And we as socialists, in a world where we're living in increased prices, prosperity, as Teddy calls it, for one and all, you know, you ask me, is £25 a week going to cripple the nation for somebody to live on a decent way to live in, in this type of society? I say not. And if the pay board wants to challenge on that one, then let Frank Figures and anybody else come up here and we'll sort it out with the men yeah. who's concerned. That's why we back them up. They never open up this way, does all work. They they fetch it off the door. They fetch it off the door. Ah, I'll run door to a year. Till I seen David, he fetched me off. The lads were happy, but down at the council offices, there were snakes. Clark and the senior officials were worried about oh, handing out money man. that the pay board said was against the law. The clerk wanted a minute, saying he was acting under duress. All he got was more duress from his employers, for believing what he read in the newspapers. We were placed under duress by certain statements of the press, and surely, Mr Green, in over 15 years of working on local authority, you're not going to let the press decide or dictate to what goes into the minutes of this council. What goes into the minutes of this council is decided by a collective body of individuals or group of people who are elected by the representatives, including yourself. So I should, in no shape or form, and I, no officer in here, that if they pick the press up tomorrow, and it says, Mr. Green said so and so, it may not have ever moved. But you just laugh it off, as you have done many, many times before. But the laugh was on the council. All the officials went on strike and won. Sooner, like I say, sooner council get rid on them, the better it'll be for us. 
and it's a shame they've had to come back, but the council have had to back down to look after our wives and kids. Not just through us, just men, wives and kids, that's what I want to tell you to They've thought about our families. They, they've gone out their way to help us again, same as they, when they set us on. The council? They, they found work in Clay Cross and they set all these men on. The 11 Clay Cross councillors saw the old year out in typically defiant mood. They had a go at the government's emergency orders. Their Christmas tree had, naturally, more lights on it than ever. In the streets, the debate carried us into 1974. It's not the 11 councillors of Clay Cross that told that money, it's us, you, you and me. Yes, we we're the ones that told that money. And if you'd have been felt in that mind, why didn't you pay it from the beginning? Because that's what you ought to have done. Because they've never put it on, we've never you been could approached have paid it. You to could pay have paid that pound. You could have paid it. Oh, no, we've never wanted. been approached to pay that You could have paid it, and if you'd have felt that, that much about it, you should have paid it. Not let these councillors carry it can for you, what and you a lot more besides. I pay 25 shillings a week. The average council house rent in Playhouse is 150 a week. Soon the rates will be higher than the council rents. My Rhodesia is. Rhodesia is the last outpost of the white man. And this is the last outpost for the Labour Party. Last outpost for Labour? Or a springboard for militancy? That's the basic problem posed by Clay Cross. Labour rebel Dick Tavair argues for a lot of moderates when he claims that Militancy by the left, and civil disobedience by the left, is dangerous because it can only produce a more powerful, a more disastrous disobedience by the right. On the other hand, the Clay Cross 11 are evangelists for kids who need milk, for pensioners who need comfort, and for council house tenants for whom a pound a week is a lot of money. All these are the kind of people who can't afford to wait round for the outcome of an abstract debate on the rule of law. It's because the gulf between these two viewpoints is so sharp and the disagreement so fundamental that we think it right to bring you the protagonist in full flow without interposing a reporter. Because it's views like those of Dick Tavern and David Skinner, views that are passionately held, which are forcing a confrontation on a basic issue in British politics. How far must people obey laws they can't stomach? David Skinner is 28. He comes from a family of rebels against authority, a family steeped in the traditions of militancy. See, feelings run very high in Clay Cross. First, when they get a mandate from the electorate, and that is an illegal opinion, in a nutshell. Then we get the uh, opinion of our local MP, Tom Swain, who tells us in no uncertain manner that uh, if you have received a mandate from the electorate, you are also carrying out the policy of the party, what we represent. So even in that, we regarded ourselves, not outside the law, but in carrying out the party policy. The local government is not just about entertaining business people and having parties and riding about in chauffeur-driven cars and chains of office. It's about things like this here, it's the people and what they live in. And if the houses aren't fit, in our opinion, of a public health inspector, etc., then we pull the houses down. You see, this school milk business, there's nothing illegal by what we're doing and providing it, apart from having a mandate from the electorate to provide it. I must remember that when Margaret Thatcher took this milk away from the kids in 1970, we quickly put it right. We used the 1966 Financial Provisions Act, something which a Labour government actually put there, it was a penny rate product, and from then on, we supplied free school milk to every kid. Every kid at the back of me here has yet received a bottle of milk for the last three years, never gone without one. So that's something commendable, and that's just an extension of the social service uh, socialism which we uh, carry out in Clay Cross. And we did have a sort of a slip up uh, of course, a slip up some while ago, we, the penny rate product did actually start to run out, but uh, no doubt Graham Skinner can tell you about how we got around that problem. We decided that uh, the only way to get around this was, that for, was to increase the chairman's allowance from a paltry sum of £25 a year to £360 a year so that uh, the free milk could be continued towards until the end of the next financial year and this was done 
uh, the chairman of the council, Charlie, um, received the cheque and promptly handed it over to the cooperative society that paid for the free milk. And that's just how we got over that problem. But the financial officer did say that the district auditor could well frown on this. He's still frowning on this, but these children aren't at the back. You see, you've got to understand really about these television licences as well. It's not just a question of outright defiance of the law yet again. It's something a little bit more than that, because we in Claycross and the people of Claycross are sick and tired of MPs and the Lords as well and all the others screaming about the plight of the old age pensioners, that they like to help them with their television licences, but unfortunately it's not possible due to the fact that there are no provisions made within the law of the land so that they can be provided with these free licences. Well, we found one. It's here. It's Nye Bevan's 1948 National Assistance Act. Now, we sought the information from Jeremy Sullivan of the Urban District Council's Association, and he quite rightly says that in, my, in view section 31 of the National Assistance Act, it gives local authorities power to provide televisions and television licences for all people. Is that defiance of the law? It isn't. It's a simple fact that the 1972 Housing Finance Act is designed not to build any more houses or anything of that nature, but to reap extra money from the council tenants. But of course, the nuts and bolts of this case are quite simple. They are. But first, when we tell Peter Walker and then Geoffrey Rippon that we had a mandate from the electorate, we're not in any way summoned under the Housing Finance Act because there are no penalties in under that. Instead, he uses the 1933 Local Government Act, an act of 40 years ago. And by simply doing that, he himself commits what we call an act of blackmail, of intimidation towards not only the councillors of Claycross, but the people as well. Of course, people now say, we've got a housing commissioner in, why don't we cooperate with him? Well, the answer is quite simple. We've been classed for the last 40 months as criminals. We've been dragged through every inconceivable court in the land. And we're still in the court, with even a prospect of going to jail. Of course, that doesn't worry me at all, because if in the end product is that, for the cause of socialism, of providing roofs over their heads and giving the people of Clay Cross a better society to live in, then uh, that's all right by me. But if for those pundits who say, now you've got a commissioner, 12 months after we asked for one, and we've got surcharges right round his neck, how the hell can they honestly say to us, sincerely and honestly, to cooperate with a commissioner? No, I'm afraid the commissioner is on his own with this one. There's no cooperation whatsoever. The cooperation went through the window when Heath and his rats decided to take us to the law courts and use the 1933 Local Government Act to humiliate us uh, and persecute us in a vain and in a fashion, whereas nobody ever in the system of a democracy could have sustained. Dick Tavern has emerged as the principal voice of socialist opposition to Clay Cross. He's the Democratic Labour MP for Lincoln, a man openly classed by the Labour Party as a renegade. He too has bucked the system. But he sees Clay Cross's refusal to compromise as a threat to both democratic socialism and to democracy itself. Some time ago, I made a speech attacking the methods of the Clay Cross councillors. I said they brought to British politics what some football excursions bring to British rail. Now, at once they issued a challenge. They said, would I defend my views? Would I debate with them at a time and place of my choosing? So I said, yes. I accepted it. I offered even to come here to Clay Cross. And the moment that challenge was accepted, it was withdrawn and they ran away. Now, I want to make some things clear. 
If they can use the law to give free milk to the kids, great. I'm just as much against the Housing Finance Act. It's a lousy act. And there's something else. I've got a certain respect for David Skinner. He has put red blood into socialism. But there's another side to the picture. And the first question is, who pays for the socialism of Clay Cross? Somebody's got to pay. And in all fairness, there's a limit to which you can help council tenants if it's at the expense of ratepayers. Ratepayers who live in an estate like this, a private estate, with one street lamp for 50 houses and a road like this. And there's another thing. How far can they now help their own people? Because if the kit is empty, how many council houses can they now build? But what really scares me about the Claycross councillors, and what I regard as absolutely fundamental in its importance, is their methods and their attitude to the law. They're past masters of the instant demonstration, of the technique of shouting people down and not giving them a hearing. If you come across them, disagree with them, you're liable to get trampled on, or you're liable to be described in contemptuous terms as a lily-white Democrat. Now that is getting too close to the tactics of the thug and the bully boy. When it comes to their attitude to the law, it's their defiance of the Housing Finance Act that's made Clay Cross a household word. They say that because it's a Tory law, they don't have to obey it. Because they've been elected on a platform of opposing the act, they've got a mandate not to implement it. But what would David Skinner say? If a Tory councillor stood on a platform of opposing public education because he didn't believe in paying rates, he would say that the law of the land required a council to provide public education, and he'd be right. And what about people who'd say, I don't believe in rates, I won't pay rates? I bet your life that if someone doesn't pay rates in Clay Cross, he's prosecuted. What's the difference a, between Tory councillors saying they won't obey Labour laws and Labour councillors saying they won't obey Tory laws. You can't pick and choose between laws and say, these are laws I like, I'll obey them. That's a law I don't like, to hell with it. Because that's the road to anarchy, that's the end of democracy. The last time people talked about lily-white Democrats and to hell with laws they didn't like, it was Oswald Mosley and the British Union of Fascists. Okay. To the Clay Cross councillors, I'm a lily-white Democrat. And I say if you want to bring about a radical change in society, you've got to start with a respect for the law. Because if you don't, then in the end, it'll be the strong-armed boys of the right who'll win. That's the kind of bitter controversy that Clay Cross produces. But here in the town itself, it's hardly noticed. It's now the 10th of January, 15 months after the Housing Finance Act came into force. What's happened so far? Well, the council house rents are still half those prevailing over the English border. The housing commissioner, well, he's eight miles away in Chesterfield, trying to increase rents by one pound by remote control. And so far, he hasn't had any success. That's because the council's rent collectors are under orders not to accept the extra pound. And the extra team of rent collectors the commissioner's put in, well, they face a rent strike by many of the tenants and also an order to the wardens of the old people's bungalows to report bogus rent collectors to the police. But in Clay Cross, that's only a minor hazard. In fact, I know of several tenants who have not fed the dog for over a week, so they could be waiting for them a an half warm welcome. The government may hope that the problem will go away when Clay Cross ceases to exist as a local government unit at the end of March. But the controlling Labour group on the new North East Derbyshire Authority has resolved not to implement the Housing Finance Act. So Clay Cross may not vanish, it may spread. O oh God, the King of Righteousness, lead us, we pray thee, in the ways of justice and of peace. Inspire us to break down all oppression and wrong, to gain for every man his due reward, and from every man his due service, that each may live for all, and all may care for each. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you.